Oh, it's going to let me. Okay. So hold on one second. Okay. Hello, and welcome to uh, the first episode of Wow, there's an expert on my screen. Uh, today, uh, we have our very first expert, Amelia Mangian, and I'm going to hand it over to her so she can introduce herself and talk about what she's going to what she's going to talk about today. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, thanks, Mike, for having me here. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, so I am a uh, PhD candidate in astronomy at the University of Illinois, um, and I mainly work on um, the evolution of supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies. And so, you know, we can look far back in time, uh, see how these things look in the past, and then see sort of how they evolve into the future. And that gives us an idea of how our galaxy might have formed. Um, so today, what I'm going to do is uh, talk a little bit about uh, how the universe got here, how it formed, uh, how it evolved. And then uh, we can talk a little bit about sort of the different scenarios for how our universe might end in the future. Um, so yeah, so let's get started. Uh, I'm gonna do like a brief overview of sort of like the timeline of how we came to understand the universe um, and then talk about sort of current results and uh, and move on to the future. Um, so what we have here back in the, the 1500s, uh, it was still thought that uh, the earth was the center of the universe. That was sort of the cosmology of the time was the earth was the center and everything revolved around it. So this is known as the um, Ptolemaic uh, geocentric model. And a couple of interesting things here is if you look in the center, uh, that's the Earth. Uh, and then as you move out, you have the moon and all the other planets that they, they knew at the time, uh, including the sun. So, you know, the sun is uh, you know, between Venus and Mars in this model. And as you go further and further out, they have these heavens, uh, the heaven of Saturn, the heaven of uh, the ninth heaven crystalline. And then all the way on the outside, they have uh, the dwelling of God. And you know, a lot of astronomy during this time was run through the church. And so there had to be a place for God in, uh, in the universe um, and in space. Uh, but as, uh, as time went on and uh, new observations were being made, um, that room for God started to disappear. And we started to get more into a, uh, a model where the Earth was not the center of everything. So as we moved into uh, the Copernican model, uh, we'll notice that this is now heliocentric. So the sun is in the center. Uh, and as we go out, you notice that Mercury is closest to the sun, uh, and then Venus and Earth, and the moon is revolving around the Earth now. Uh, and then as we go out, we get all the other planets. And the, the, the interesting thing to note here is that they have, uh, on the very outside, they have this sphere of fixed stars. And this is an interesting idea because uh, when you look at the night sky over the course of thousands of years, uh, it doesn't look like these these stars ever move across the sky. They appear in the same position on the sky um, for everybody's lifetime, really. And so they had no other reason to believe that these stars were moving or anything else outside of the solar system was moving. But as the telescope was invented uh, by Galileo, and uh, he kind of stole that design, but um, and uh, observations uh, started happening with these telescopes, uh, we eventually got to um, the, what is called the Messier Catalog. So Messier Catalog is essentially uh, this, this French guy, uh, I don't remember his first name, but his last name's Messier. He basically went and he took uh, observations of 
every really bright, fuzzy thing in the sky. So uh, they weren't really sure what these things were, uh, but what it turns out is uh, that these things are uh, <clears throat> nebulae, so the remnants of supernovae or stars that are shooting off material, uh, other galaxies, and these star clusters um, with thousands of stars in them. And so this is, this is actually um, a compilation done by an amateur photographer. Uh, and so you can see even with like uh, small equipment, even with uh, you know, a small telescope and a DSLR camera, you can get these really beautiful pictures. And so at this point in time, it was still thought that this was part of the Milky Way galaxy. Um, you know, we, just like we had no reason to believe that the stars were moving, we had no reason to believe that there was anything else but the Milky Way and that we were at the center of the Milky Way. Um, but again, as time goes on and we get better and better observations, uh, the debates happen. And this is, this is called the, the great debate. So we have two sides of the story here. We have Harlow Shapley, who uh, believes that, uh, so we're looking at the Andromeda galaxy here, which is our, our, our uh, nearest neighbor of uh, a Milky Way-like galaxy. And he says, there's no way that this could be part of the Milky Way because it would have to be 100 million light years away. And that distance was unfavorable. Uh, it, 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 you know, there was, there was no uh, person in their right mind who would think that something could be that far away. Um, but on the other side of the debate, we have uh, Haber Curtis, who says, uh, who's looked at the observations of this, uh, of this galaxy and said, hey, look, if this was part of the Milky Way, why does it seem so different than the rest of the galaxy? You know, there's, uh, there's different rates of supernovae and, uh, you know, there's different content of stars and uh, all these varying properties from what, you know, we know of, of the Milky Way. And so this became a very, very big debate and it wasn't settled really until Edwin Hubble came around. So here comes Edwin Hubble, um, very famous astronomer. Uh, and he says, well, turns out when I look at this galaxy, I see that uh, it's moving away from us. And it wouldn't make sense uh, for this thing to be moving away from us if, well, it was part of the Milky Way. Well, it turns out he was a little bit wrong because the Andromeda is actually coming towards us and we're gonna collide with it in the future at some point. But it turns out that Herbert Curtis was correct. Well, mostly, and Alex, uh, Harlow Shapley was incorrect, mostly. There's a few things that each of them got right. But it turns out that, you know, this, uh, this island galaxy this, uh, is its own, is its own independent thing. And so the, the Andromeda galaxy is a strong independent galaxy. You don't need no Milky Way. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, sort of how Hubble made his discovery um, and what that implies about the current state of the universe. So this is a plot from Hubble's famous paper in 1929, talking about uh, this relationship that he came up with, seeing that galaxies, the farther away that they are, the faster they're moving away from us. And so uh, in the bottom left-hand corner here, we see Hubble sitting at the, the telescope at Mount Wilson, um, doing meticulous observations of these galaxies, trying to uh, look, looking at particular stars in the galaxies, trying to figure out how far away they are. And uh, so it turns out uh, on the x-axis here, it's the distance, on the y-axis, it's the velocity. Uh, Hubble really only took the data for the distance. He kind of uh, stole Vesto Slipher's data here about uh, how fast these things were moving away. But who gets all the credit? Hubble does. 
because he wrote the paper. So that goes to show you, if you write the paper, you get the fame. Um, but so what this is telling us is that the things in the galaxy outside of the, uh, the things in the universe outside of the Milky Way, they're all moving away from us. And they're doing so uh, uniformly across the sky. No matter which way you look, everything is always moving away from us. Now, that was a big shock to people because, uh, like I pointed out in that model prior, uh, the, the uh, Copernican model, we thought that everything outside of the solar system was stationary. Um, and so this was a huge shock to people, uh, even Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein, uh, you know, prior to this discovery in 1929, had worked out the theory of general relativity. And it turns out that um, Einstein was so steadfast in his belief that the universe was static that he modified the equation that he derived explaining the, uh, uh, the way that the universe works um, to include this, this uh, term here that I've crossed out with the arrow. Um, and so with this term, he put this in because he said, oh, the universe can't be expanding or contracting. It needs to be static. And so we put in this cosmological constant to keep the universe from expanding or contracting. And it turns out that that was a huge mistake uh, because as Hubble has shown here, really the universe is expanding. And it turns out that Alexander Friedman here, he had already determined this a few years prior uh, by using Einstein's equation and saying, well, if we look at this closely, uh, a static universe is unstable, meaning that if you push it just a little bit, it'll either contract or expand. Um, and so it's, a uh, there's, there's really no way that this universe could be static because just a little nudge would throw everything into chaos. So this was sort of the, uh, beginning of the hunt to, uh, understanding the way, uh, that the universe came to be. Uh, this was not a big field of astronomy and astrophysics at the time. Uh, people were much more concerned about home, uh, the solar system, the, uh, the gas in the Milky Way. This sort of kick-started uh, cosmology as a field. So in the 60s, uh, there was this uh, antenna made at Bell Labs, and Bell Labs is kind of a big, uh, big thing back in the, the 50s and the 60s in terms of science. And these two guys, uh, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, they were both radio astronomers. So they like to send out radio, or like, they like to collect radio uh, waves from uh, the universe, uh, or from the galaxy more precisely, to, to try to understand sort of the contents and uh, the way that stars forms in, uh, in the galaxy. And, so eventually, in the 60s, they, uh, they finally got a chance to use this for science. And what they found is that there was this weird signal um, that was always there, no matter which way they pointed, no matter what time of the year. There was always the signature. There was always the signature. And they had no idea what it was. They thought maybe it was the instrument itself. Uh, it turns out that wasn't it. They, uh, they climbed into this instrument and they cleared out all the birds that were living in there and it turns out that wasn't it either. It was an inherent property of the universe itself. So what's known now as the cosmic microwave background. And so if you look at these, these three ovals here, this is an all sky look at what the, um, this background radiation looks like. And so this, this first one here, the all red one, is saying that this uh, cosmic microwave background is almost completely uniform across the entire sky. So it's at one precise temperature. And it's not until we start looking at the changes in the temperature, the fluctuation, where we start to see these, uh, these patterns come out. 
in the next two parts down. And if you look at the bottom one, uh, this says the change in temperature is 18 micro Kelvin. So this is like, uh, there's a one in 10,000 uh, change in temperature between points in the sky, which is incredibly small, like incredibly small. How do you even build an instrument sensitive enough to uh, determine that? Um, it turns out you have to build really, really, really good instruments. And so um, in the late 80s, the, the COBE satellite was, was made to the study of the cosmic microwave background. Uh, and eventually new missions came out with WMAP and Planck. And as you can see, as we've gotten better and better instruments, the resolution that we can look at these, uh, these uh, deviations from the cosmic microwave background temperature, uh, the more detail we get. And so when we look at it today, this is what we get. We get this beautiful, beautiful map of, uh, of, of temperature fluctuations where the red spots are warm places and the cold spots are, or the blue spots are cold places. But you have to remember that these are 10,000, uh, one in 10,000 fluctuations in the temperature from that 2.7 Kelvin. So what this is telling us is that the universe is really, really homogenous. It's pretty much the same anywhere you look on large scales. Um, but when we think about this, uh, if the universe is expanding and the, um, there's this hot radiation that's left over from uh, very, very long back in the history of the universe, <clears throat> there has to be something that's causing all of this radiation to persist today. And so this led people to um, consider uh, the universe starting as a singular point. And one of the people who, were, who was uh, you know, integral to this was, was Stephen Hawking and, and thinking of the Big Bang Theory. And I would love to tell you that we could, uh, you know, look back and observe this directly, but the cosmic microwave background is as far back as we can look. So I'll give you a little bit of an idea of what we think it might look like. So remember, these are all artist conceptions of the Big Bang. Um, so we have a comic book, we've got a movie, a TV show, uh, a wrestling competition, and a, a, a K-pop band. So these are all the Big Bang. Um, you know, like I said, nobody really knows what it is, so it could be any of these things. But uh, really what the Big Bang is, is it's, uh, you know, it's this uh, singularity of, of all of the energy and matter of the universe in a single point. And when the Big Bang happens, the, uh, the space in the universe rapidly expands. So it's not like an explosion, um, but it's, it's, a, um, it's an expansion of space itself. So there were some problems to this theory that eventually got worked out, um, which I can talk about a little bit here on this next slide. Um, this is the current state of how we understand the history of the universe. So if we look at the far left, that's where the Big Bang is. And uh, right after the Big Bangs, there's these quantum fluctuations, these very, very tiny, tiny differences in the way that the matter uh, has organized itself uh, right after the Big Bang. And uh, there's this period of very rapid expansion called inflation, which sets in stones those little tiny fluctuations. And that leaves the imprint of the cosmic microwave background. So those, those little fluctuations in temperature that we see are really, they correspond to um, clumps and voids of matter in the universe, which eventually 
will um, separate themselves even further and be the places where galaxies form. Now, really what we're looking at is the, um, is the, uh, the content of dark matter in the universe. So dark matter is this uh, you know, mysterious thing we don't really know all that much about, but we do know that dark matter is needed to form galaxies uh, the way that we see them today. And so as these uh, clumps of dark matter uh, start to form, we get the development of stars, we get the development of galaxies and planets, um, and eventually we get to today, 14-ish uh, 14, 14 billion years later. And so I mentioned dark matter, uh, and dark matter is, is critical to the uh, formation of the large-scale structure of the universe that we see today. So uh, the formation of galaxies, the formation of galaxy clusters, which is basically um, a grouping of a bunch of galaxies in one space. Um, <clears throat> and so I want to show you this, this uh, simulation that was done, which shows you how over time dark matter condenses to form these galaxies and galaxy clusters. So let's hope I can get this to run. There we go. So as you can see, you kind of start with this uniform, this uniform background uh, of, of matter. And as time goes on, you start to see these clumps and filamentary structures form. And so when we look at the universe today, when we do these big surveys uh, of looking at galaxies, we see this structure, we, we see this clumpiness across the sky where uh, galaxies sort of fall into these specific spots. And when you look in all parts of the sky, uh, on the large scale, it looks the same in all directions. Um, and the interesting thing about that is, is when we think about it, if everything looks the same all the way around, well, we're not too darn special. There's not one place in the universe that is the center um, or unique in any way. And so it's funny because I've been, I've been playing Super Mario Galaxy from Super 3D All-Stars, which Mike has been playing through uh, on his channel. And uh, you're supposed to go save Princess Peach at the center of the universe. It makes me chuckle every time because there's no center of the universe. So Nintendo got it wrong, but we we can you know as astronomers can 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 tell it right. So I'm going to go back to this um, this this figure here, um, and I want you to notice on the far right side it says dark energy accelerated expansion. Ooh, dark energy. So dark energy is even more mysterious than dark matter. We have no clue what it is, no clue at all. Um, but it turns out that this, this, uh, the dark energy is causing the universe to expand at this accelerating rate. So it was thought for a while that, you know, everything was expanding and it's gonna kind of coast to this, um, you know, like just kind of coast until it expands forever. But what we're finding is that the universe is actually expanding at an accelerated rate. And so this gives, uh, this gives an interesting, uh, it, it makes it interesting to think about then, well, what will happen to the universe in the future if the universe is expanding like this? And so here are a couple of uh, ideas for what might happen. So in the blue, uh, this is called the big rip. So if the acceleration of the universe continues at the current rate, or if it gets if it gets even more severe, then there's a possibility that all matter, all atoms, all somatomic particles will get ripped apart because of the expansion of the universe. So this is called the big rip. There's also uh, this this red one here, which is a, a constant dark energy. And so, do you remember that uh, that cosmological constant that Einstein put into his equation? It's curious because 
he calls that the biggest blunder of his career. Uh, trying to put in this cosmological constant to make the universe static. Well, it turns out he wasn't so wrong after all. This cosmological constant can actually be used to explain the phenomena of dark energy, this, this outward pressure that's causing the universe to accelerate uh, in its expansion. So he was kind of right, kind of wrong, but it's funny because the biggest blunder of his career self-proclaimed blunder of his career really didn't turn out to be so wrong after all. Now, one of the more interesting ideas for the, the fate of the universe is something called the Big Crunch. So if we uh, go on in time and somehow gravity takes over, uh, gravity gets stronger than dark energy, then it's theorized that everything will fall back into each other uh, so as the Big Bang started as one point, the end of the universe would fall back into that same point. Um, so these are a, a couple of possibilities, but it turns out that um, we can do measurements so, so precise that we're pretty darn sure what the, what the fate of the universe is going to look like based on these observations. So take a note at this red one it says it's a constant dark energy <clears throat> so back in 2018 the Planck collaboration that Planck satellite that I was talking about they they did really really precise measurements of uh, the cosmic microwave background and from that they can extract all sorts of information about the universe <clears throat> so up at the top here they find that uh, this omega sub k uh, parameter, this is essentially telling us what the curvature of space-time is, where if it's zero, it's flat. If it's one, it's positively curved. And if it's uh, less than, if it's greater than zero, it's positively curved. If it's less than one, it's negatively curved. They're finding that it's pretty much flat. So that suggests that, uh, you know, there, this is more evidence towards that constant dark energy fate. Now also, they, uh, they can look at something called the equation of state of dark energy. And uh, basically what happens is, is if this W parameter is minus one, it implies that we have this cosmological constant. There's no evolution in uh, there's no evolution in like the energy of dark of dark energy, and so that's also consistent with this this uh, this constant dark energy model here. It's sort of uh, implying that the big rip and the big crunch couldn't happen. So I'd also like to point out that, um, as you can see from these other plots, that these observations can constrain. Uh, the the um, the different various parameters of the universe so so tightly. So in this plot up on the top right, this this blue line is a theoretical model, and it pretty much exactly matches those data points. And also here in the bottom left, we can uh, we can precisely say what the primordial abundance of helium is and how many neutrinos we expect to be in the universe. So neutrinos are a fundamental particle. Um, and uh, right after the Big Bang, um, atoms started to form. And we can precisely say how much uh, hydrogen and helium were present in the universe right after that. So this is really cool. Really, really cool. We we know all of this stuff super precisely, but we still have no clue what dark matter and dark energy are. We know that it constitutes almost all of the universe. As you can see in this pie chart, dark energy is something like 68%. Dark matter is something like 27% of the universe. Um, and the stuff that we see in galaxies and stars and planets is only about 5% of the universe. So we understand the universe to a very precise degree, but we don't understand its constituents. So all this evidence points to this 
uh, this um, constant dark energy fate of the universe. And I want to do like a little brief idea of what that looks like. So this is also called the heat death of the universe. Where essentially expansion will occur until the universe reaches absolute zero temperature. So there, there's no more energy left in the universe. And for that to happen, um, there, there would uh, there'd be this interesting phenomenon called Hawking radiation, which Stephen Hawking uh, theoretically derived that uh, black holes can evaporate. They can spit out these particles um, that will cause, uh, so, so eventually the universe will, all of its matter will eventually turn into black holes. And as uh, the universe gets colder and colder, these black holes will start to spit out energy. Um, so I won't get into the details of this, but essentially, um, Although nothing can escape a black hole, theoretically, somehow these particles can. So this is a super interesting idea that we'll never really be able to test because um, the universe would have to be super duper cold to be able to test this. Um, and so we're not really sure where this theory stands, but it's really interesting to think about that uh, if these black holes evaporate, the universe will essentially be nothing. And that's kind of a sad, a sad fate of the universe, but it's most likely what we're looking towards at the moment. So uh, to finish up, I'm gonna leave you with a couple of interesting questions about uh, the universe and what we don't understand currently. So this top plot here is the Hubble constant. Um, so when uh, Edwin Hubble created this, this relationship between distance and velocity, there has to be some sort of proportionality constant that allows you to interchange between the velocity and the distance. And so it turns out that via various methods of measuring this constant, we get this great separation between two models. Uh, the, the Cepheid variable model and the CMB. And this is uh, such a big problem that um, we think that there might need to be new physics discovered to explain it. This has been a big, big, big uh, back and forth uh, trying to understand uh, what really is the Hubble constant because we're getting more and more precise measurements, but they're not agreeing. Another interesting question is, well, why is the universe composed of ordinary matter uh, rather than antimatter. And so if, if when a, a matter particle and an antimatter particle combine, they annihilate each other and nothing is left. So if there was equal amount of matter and antimatter, then why is the universe in existence today? And so it turns out that there was a slight, slightly, slightly, slightly more matter than antimatter, but we really don't know why. And so that's a big question. <clears throat> and the last thing is, what is dark matter? This is the standard model of elementary particles, basically every uh, fundamental particle we've ever discovered. Uh, but dark matter can't be any of them. So where does dark matter fit into this picture? If it's not something that we already know of, then what could it be? And so this is a big big issue in particle physics and trying to figure out, you know, where did we go wrong? What, what's new? So I'll leave it at that and give Mike a, an opportunity to ask a couple of questions. Uh, and thank you all for taking the time to listen. Well, thank you for being willing to present. Um, so uh, the first thing, um, just kind of more of a basic thing, but you're, you're a, you said you're a graduate. You're a graduate student. Mm -hmm. You're a PhD. Um, how does how does that work when it comes to physics? So what what are the stages required for you to go through graduate school? Yeah. So the the first thing is you have to have a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. So you have to go to college. You have to get um, 
uh, a bachelor's degree in some field uh, relevant to physics or astronomy. So I got a degree in physics uh, and then I moved to astronomy. So there's a big application process to getting into grad school. Uh, you have to write personal statements, you have to get letters of recommendation, uh, and most of the time you have to, um, pretty much all the time, you have to have prior research experience. Because when you get hired on to be a graduate student, they're hiring you with the thought that you're going to be able to produce uh, science. And so they want to have some proof that um, you have that ability. So that's really important is to get these research opportunities, either through your own institution or uh, through National Science Foundation uh, research experience for undergrad funded programs. Mm -hmm. So I, I did research both at my institution and then one of these REUs. Um, so then sort of after you get admitted, you kind of have to pick where you want to go. Um, and then you have to find an advisor with research that you like. Uh, and that's kind of starts you on your path to getting your thesis. Cool. Awesome. Um, do you have your own telescope? And then um, how much does like, a, if you somebody really wanted to like get into astronomy and just wanted to get like a, a starter telescope, how much, how much money would they, would that kind of cost? Yeah, so I do have my own telescope. Um, unfortunately, being in more of a, an urban environment, it's hard to use it sometimes. Although mm -hmm. there is a dark sky site uh, not too far from here, which I'm planning on going to at some point. Uh, but if you want to get a telescope, you can find, um, you know, some that are a decent size that aren't all that expensive, maybe uh, a couple hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it is, uh, it is tedious to make telescopes. And so they are, uh, you know, there is a financial barrier to getting one. Sure. Um, but uh, even just using a pair of binoculars, um, you know, using a pair of binoculars, you can see a lot of these objects pretty clearly. Mm -hmm. You won't see them in color like this. Um, right. But but you can uh, see them pretty well. So um, even if you can't get a telescope, just uh, you know a pair of opera glasses or something like that, or you know, mm -hmm. a pair of binoculars would really help in being able to see these things, especially the planets. Cool. Um, so you talked a little bit about um, how we don't really know anything about dark energy or dark matter. Mm -hmm. um, what's being done so that we do learn about them? Right, so um, in terms of dark matter, um, there's sort of two aspects to this. There's the, um, the particle physics side, and then there's the uh, astrophysics side. Mm -hmm. Particle physicists, um, they have experiments like the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Geneva, mm -hmm. um, and that's where most of these particles were discovered. Um, they're trying to, um, all the time discover new particles. Right. And so the hope is, is that, um, somehow they'll be able to find something <clears throat> that, um, that would be consistent with dark matter. Um, okay. and that's a difficult thing because, um, the requirements for dark matter is that, um, it interacts with it doesn't interact with ordinary matter. It doesn't produce any radiation. <clears throat> right. And so it's, it's very, very difficult to detect. There right. are. So some... even if you, you did find it, even if you did find it, it'd be hard to, to know it was there. <clears throat> right, right. So we have um, <clears throat> some experiments that are, you know, like either in big mine shafts or in mountains mm -hmm. um, that are hoping to detect interactions of uh, dark matter with ordinary matter uh -huh. um, because even if it's very very unlikely there is a chance that it could and uh, these experiments have been running for decades and nothing has been found. Um, on the astrophysics side um, it's a little bit harder to do. Um, 
because there's lots of different ways to uh, observationally confirm that dark matter exists, but it's really hard to um, get any fine details on what it could actually be. So mm -hmm. the astrophysics side of things hammers home really well that dark matter has to be there. Right. Uh, it's difficult to understand, uh, you know, what it is. Um, in terms of dark energy, our understanding is very limited. We, we know that um, it essentially has to be something that pushes away matter. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, other than that, there's really not much that we know. Um, and so there's lots of... Um, big surveys that are conducted trying to um, probe farther and farther back in time so that uh -huh. we can get observations of the early universe to um, hope that we can gather some information about it. Um, and so, for instance, there's uh, the Dark Energy Survey. Um, there is going to be the uh, large survey of space and time at the Vera Rubin Observatory that comes online next year, I think. Uh, and these are all going to be dedicated to trying to uh, understand dark energy better, among other things. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So then just one more question, or I guess it's not really a question, but more of like a, a request. Um, if you, if there was someone who wanted to become or is interested in astronomy or wants to become an astronomer, where would you point them out for like resources or like websites or books or places where they could go and explore and get interested um, in Ooh. in what you do and your your stuff? Yeah, well, I'm glad that you pointed that out. I'm prepared. Oh my goodness. So um, <clears throat> the thing that I will uh, point out is you should obviously subscribe to my brother's channel. Um, and Ooh. I'll make this talk publicly available. Um, so that everybody can have access to it and get the links. Awesome. Um, there is, if you want a little bit more technical detail, <clears throat> um, the astronomy department here at the University of Illinois, they're starting to uh, make their colloquium talks where visiting scientists come in and speak about their research. They're making those publicly available on YouTube. Oh, okay. So if you have interest in watching those, those are available. Now, uh, our department also hosts something called Astronomy on Tap, where it's more of like a general science talk uh, aimed at the general population. Um, okay. And you can find these things um, everywhere. Like most major universities have an Astro on Tap or some sort of physics outreach um, that will uh, try to communicate these big science topics and, uh, you know, in, in terms that everybody can understand. Sure. Um, there's also these two great resources called Astrobytes and Astro Soundbytes. Astro Soundbytes is actually uh, founded in part by one of my colleagues here at the University of Illinois. Um, but these are uh, uh, groups of like graduate students who um, will will read uh, in you know academic papers that are published by researchers, and they'll parse them down in the terms that you know, like undergraduates and high schoolers can understand. Okay. So this is a good way to keep up on um, new, new, um, you know, new advances in the field. Okay. Um, I will also uh, point out that you're, if you're interested in um, sort of understanding how astronomy works and, uh, you know, want to see how we can make astronomy a good place, I'll point you to the Society of Equity and Astronomy. Mm -hmm. Society for Equity and Astronomy, this is an organization that I run here at the university, uh, which is aimed towards um, uh, promoting and supporting uh, uh, underrepresented minorities in the field. Sure. And then, of course, if you want to learn more about me and my research, I have a website and uh, a link to my publications. In terms of, of books, um, there's, there's these great um, resources. It's called, um, I think, OpenStax, mm -hmm. which are free online textbooks um, oh, that um, 
different professors and academics uh, dedicate their time to making so that there's free accessible materials for people mm -hmm. um, to, to be able to, to, to better understand various different topics. There's, there's math books, there's physics books, there's astronomy. Um, so those are really valuable resources. Um, and I guess the, the other thing, um, you know, go to your library, check out a, a, a pop science book and, mm -hmm. and read it. And, you know, you might not understand everything that they're saying, but <clears throat> when you start to learn about the different terms and uh, interesting things in the universe, then, you know, it can start leading you to uh, other resources that can, uh, you know, lead you on the path to, you know, really loving science. So. Right. Yeah. Well, and of course, like if you do go to the library and check out a book like that, that's where, you know, a teacher or an educator can come in and you could be like, you could get this idea or you find this word that you don't understand and you come in and, you know, you go to science class the next day and you're like, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so, what's the black hole? Tell me what that is. And like, they can, Exactly. they probably know more about it than you do and they can at least point you in the right direction like that's their job um so awesome i mean i'd also encourage you to um you know if you ever have questions about astronomy or are interested in getting involved in some way um if you go to my website my email is on there and feel free to to email me <clears throat> and i can point you in the right direction to you know, somebody or some resource that could that could help out. Right. And, abs and after this video does go live on my channel, um, if you do have questions and you don't feel um, you don't feel like you want to bother my sister by emailing her, um, you can absolutely comment on the video and I'll make sure that she gets your question. Um, yeah, and we'll make sure that we get your questions answered. Um, I think we're probably going to wrap it up, though. Yeah. What are they like 47 minutes or something like that? It's gonna be a <laughs> long YouTube video. <laughs> um, but yeah, once again, thank you so much, Amelia, for yeah, for uh presenting. Um if you really liked what Amelia had to say, don't worry. She's gonna be coming back to wow, there's an expert on my screen uh in the future. Um and uh stay tuned for for more experts and more awesome knowledge and stuff. Uh thanks for watching. Bye. Thanks, everybody.